Good afternoon, everyone. We're running a few minutes behind, but um, we want to go ahead and get started. This is a very important set of presentations that we will have this afternoon. My name is Fred Schroeder. I'm the president of the World Blind Union. And the World Blind Union is dedicated to the social and economic integration of blind and partially sighted people. And by way of introduction, I would say that there is nothing more fundamental than the ability to travel independently. I became totally blind at age 16. And when I became blind, I did not have a cane. I did not have any training. I was totally dependent on my family and friends. And I remember quite vividly my impression at that time was that blindness meant to wait, to be taken from one place and put in another and told to wait. And so when I began to acquire the skills to travel independently, it solved a practical problem. That is to say, it gave me mobility, but it solved a problem that was more insidious, something deeper and more profound, and that is it helped free me from the belief that to be blind meant to be passive. This afternoon, you'll hear about some innovative technologies that are enhancing independent travel for blind people in dramatic ways. And these technologies help further support that integration. Not only do they help break that barrier, that limitation of access that comes from lack of information about the built environment and so on, but also helping strengthen the idea of belonging, that blind people and people with low vision have a right to full participation. The bios of each of our speakers are included in the program, and since we're a few minutes behind, I'm going to just launch right in and uh, introduce our first speaker. Our sp first speaker will talk about L the LVL LVE system, a new system to orientate and inform blind people and let me introduce to you for this presentation, Mr. Giulio Nardone. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, good afternoon to everybody, ladies and gentlemen. I think it's better that I uh, give the floor to my personal assistant, Laura, that is also, by the way, my personal daughter, because she speaks uh, English better than me. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Okay, uh, I, I do, we do uh, subscribe the fact that you don't have to be passive when you're blind. Uh, that's why we, we create, we, uh, well, that's, that's exactly what we will be talking now in, the, in, the, in our presentation, actually. So, uh, Okay, so uh, our, our association actually is, which is spelled Associazione Disabili Visivi, is a non-profit organization and is an association, the Italian Association for the Blind People, and has got uh, nearly 50 years of history. And we, in our history, we always tried to um, help blind people to be autonomous, efficient, and fully integrated in their social environment, and also thanks to new technologies. That's why uh, more than 30 years ago, we actually created the standards for tactile path, tactile piping for the blind people in Italy. And, uh, and now, thanks to new technologies, we have evolved the system adding vocal information that are integrated in the tiles. Because uh, according to the Italian law, uh, tactile paths have to be installed in all public areas and buildings and in any private building that is open to public. Oh, sorry, doesn't, no, sorry, can I see Okay. 
uh, tactile paths alone are not enough. Though they are installed in many areas, like uh, uh, trains, underground stations, bus stops, uh, uh, most of footpaths and pavement, uh, airports, public offices, hospitals, shopping areas, supermarkets, sports centers, theaters, um, all post offices and um, many museums, they are not uh, enough to help uh, the, uh, the blind person because a blind person doesn't know exactly where, they, where, they are, where he is. So, um, according to the Italian law, uh, no, I went back, sorry. Accor uh, according to the Italian law, uh, the, um, the, the blind has also the, to need, has also the need to know exactly where they are. Um, that's why we created this new system and that has the vocal parts of it. Uh, the tactile paths are, um, are now, are, uh, may say some, may give you a message like you are on Oxford Street heading to Piccadilly Circus, or you are on Platform 5 and the exit is on your right, or um, uh, now you are at the bus stop and there is the bus number 4 that is heading to I don't know where. And uh, or uh, maybe the information desk is straight on, and this office is open from nine to twelve. Or um, uh, maybe uh, if you are in a in a sports center, uh, athlete lockers are on the right. Uh, for the public, the public can go on the stairs, just turn left. But can even give you deeper information. Something like maybe, okay, now you can touch this on your right. You can touch the statue of Venus that was created by Canova in blah blah blah, and uh, you can touch her left arm that covers her breast because uh, she doesn't want you to see her breast and so on. So it gives you a lot of, deta uh, of either detailed information or just uh, basic information like go right and, and left. But actually, uh, you, uh, you, they are mostly needed uh, uh, vocal and tactile parts in emergency situation because uh, um, in a, a blind pers person has the right to find the escape route by himself. Of course, it's quicker. But uh, uh, and uh, blind, a blind person cannot follow a written sign, or uh, and furthermore, an alarm that sounds actually doesn't help to orientate because it is all over the place. And uh, a, a blind person, of course, cannot be left alone, uh, to, uh, in waiting, as you were saying, for someone to come and pick him up and, and find to the escape route or has not the, the, the time in, a, in an emergency situation to read a braille map or even find the, the, the emergency button to press. Uh, with this uh, integrated vocal and tactile path, the blind person will know exactly where he is, where he has to go and uh, how to behave in case of an emergency situation. So, in short, how it works, LVE, which is the, the, the acronym for Logis Vet Evolution System, is a tactile paving system having in it integrated, accurate voice directions and messages. And you can even choose the language you, language you want the message. Uh, it works without the need of any power supply or batteries. Therefore, once it has been installed, it can last forever, or at least until the tiles are in place, of course. And um, so uh, let, let's see how it works. Uh, I, I'm showing, showing a diagram, uh, but I will explain. So actually, we have a tactile path, uh, which, is, uh, uh, which has in it the, um, uh, what we call, um, uh, under the tiles, they have the pass uh, we call passive tags. That means that there are tags with the uh, ground frequency, uh, radio frequency ground uh, technology that are not uh, um, that um, they have not to be alimentated by any power supply, any batteries, or anything by like that. And uh, the, these tags are read by the antenna, which is placed just behind the white stick, or it can be even a, an ankle bracelet. 
the vocal message, then a vocal message is spoken and in, in, uh, in, with, uh, with your smartphone. Uh, um, so with the using, uh, by using an app, uh, of course, either with the Apple phones or uh, Android phones, um, you can access the European Data Bank that actually links the tag to the, to the right indisputable message. It means that uh, there is only one message for that tile. You cannot, uh, you cannot have the, um, uh, there is no any chances that you get the wrong messages. So this is for safety reason, because you cannot get the message that you have to go to the right if there is a, dangerous on, a danger on the right. So, um, so with LVE, uh, a blind person has Actually, it's very easy to use. Once you have downloaded the app, you just walk on the tactile path, and actually you can test it just right in front of the, the welcome desk. And the info point, info corner, there is our tactile path, and uh, uh, we will have people there with, uh, with our sticks, with the, the, with the sticks, so you, um, you can just walk there, and you will hear the messages. You can, uh, in this case, you can choose either English or Italian, of course. And uh, you will receive vocal messages um, and um, this directions, di information, descriptions. I mean, you can choose actually not only the, the language, the speed of the speech, but also what kind of, of infos you need. Uh, if you want just a, more, uh, just a quick, uh, uh, you are crossing uh, Oxford Street, or you want more detailed, maybe even touristic informations, information. So actually, um, LV, uh, LVE is, uh, um, already, has been already installed in Italy in many, many, many places. Uh, so we have it, for example, in, uh, uh, in train stations like uh, Rome and, uh, and uh, Bologna and others. Uh, we have in airports, for example, Rome, Naples, and many others. And uh, we have uh, in uh, many theaters, we had it in uh, Expo 2015. Uh, we, had, we, ha we have it in many exhibition places. And uh, we have it in, um, even in parks. And it, it is, of course, it has to be integrated with the, our, our uh, all the paths have to be integrated with the, the, the maps sometimes. Um, most. And in hospitals, in, um, in uh, sports centers, for example, there is a big sports center in Rome that has been all uh, covered with, uh, with this tactile path. And a blind person, either if he's an athlete or just a person that comes to watch his son uh, um, uh, foot, uh, football match, has the right to move autonomously and both in case of uh, uh, just to go there or, or in an emergency situation to escape. And then we have uh, uh, even important architects like Mr. Renzo Piano and uh, Mr. Fuxas, they uh, are using uh, tactile paths in, uh, uh, in their auditoriums and uh, forum centers. Uh, of course, it has been installed in many streets and squares telling you exactly where you are, what you are crossing, and if there is any point of interest, uh, interest like there is the, um, uh, the office, and the office is open from 9 to 12, or there is a, uh, a medical center whatsoever. OK, many thanks. <laughs> of course, he, he, OK. Thank you very much. Uh, quite an interesting presentation. We have uh, three more to go here that uh, I think will be. Is this no, on? I'm, I'm not. There we go. Okay. Thank you. So, our uh, next presentation is entitled Lazario Improving the Autonomy of People with Visual Impairment. And to make this presentation, I introduce to you Renee Espinosa. Okay. Um, let me check. Okay. Hello. Yeah. Well, hello. Thank you. Uh, I'm really glad to be here. This is my first time in Zero Project. I'm Rene. I come from Chile. I live in Santiago, Chile. 
and I will tell you about what is Lazarillo. Lazarillo is a startup, and we believe that we can create accessible and intelligent places that connect people through the use of technology with their information. Because if you go to an airport, if you go to a mall, if you go to a hospital, you always need information, how to get the service you want to get. So we have created a mobile app that uses first crowdsourced information for you to navigate through the city. So we use different kind of database so that the, the user can get through voice messages, information of where they're working, the services that are around them, like bus stops, coffee shops, banks, etc. You can also uh, search through the app places that are not in your, near you, but far beyond. Like you want to go to a, uh, the house of a friend, something like that. You will get all this through Lazarillo, and you will get from your home to that place. With different kind of uh, like routing, like going walking or even calling an Uber. Oh. So how you use them? Uh, people use it having the phone in their pockets with um, headphones and walking with either user cane or maybe a guide dog. And they will get information about their surroundings while they walk. Uh, the guy in the photo this up here is Miguel, that is in charge of the user experience. Uh, he born, he's born blind and he uses Lazarillo every day. But not only in the streets, he can actually get inside the, a bank that appears on the picture and get to know how to get inside, where the ADM, how to get to a front desk, etc. And we do that through our, our platform, that we, create, that we upload your maps, for example, to our platform, not only the, pla the planes, but also information that provides the user more referential information so that he can locate itself. We can map places that are indoor or outdoor. For example, a university that you can have a mix, or a park, or even a hospital. But we use different kind of information, from geopoints to beacon technology to make it all transparent to the user. Because the user doesn't know there are beacons around. They just, he just knows that that place is accessible. So when he gets inside, he receives a message, and he can navigate. He can also search places inside a place direct, so he can go from point A to point B in order to, for him to be a better experience. All through Lazarillo, there is a free mobile app that works for, in Android and iOS in both Spanish and English and works all over the world. Right now, uh, for the companies, we also provide them a, a portal where they get statistics of usage, where they can, people can validate their services and also can get, um, like the companies can update their information, for example. So here is an example. Uh, this is an event that uh, was made in a park. Uh, on the left side, I show uh, our platform where there are geo points. Because it's in an open park, you can use um, GPS points with more information. When you upload that, you can also get um, a pop-up banner where you can show the event. So you have a picture, but also uh, it will, uh, Lazarillo will tell you what is it. Because like for events, this information we all get lost, and we all need the information where to get food, for example. So when you press that ad, you will get the program, the schedule, all the food places, the stands, every information you will need to add uh, in, a, in a way that you can locate itself. Also, if you're navigating through, uh, through that park, you will get information through voice messages. For example, if I'm passing through a stage, as you will tell me that the stage is in my right side or in, I don't know, 20 meters from me. Right now, we are in 14 countries with 7,500 active users uh, weekly uh, through our 40,000 downloads. And, but these are not only downloads. People are actually loving, it, loving this service and telling us things like, very nice job, thank you for improving the quality of my life, angels do exist. We get this because we're uh, always getting feedback from users from all over the world through WhatsApp and beta testers that we test this out before launching. Our business model is that we provide a free mobile app for users, but for businesses we, and public institutions, we sell a sof uh, serv software as a service. So you get an, act an activation of your place and then you get a subscription. 
we have currently work, one of our like, uh, big uh, companies that we have been working are muse uh, museums, that are the human rights museums. Here, uh, we made an accessible uh, tour, so the museum is accessible, but you can also have a tour that is accessible. What it means that a tour that is accessible is that you can start the tour from the front desk, for example, and it will guide you from point to point. In each point, uh, the museum uh, creates videos with cell language, audio, and caption. So everyone that are using the tour can get all the information. With a, uh, with a bank that is called Banco Estado, that is um, a pub, uh, the most biggest bank in Chile, uh, we are now uh, going from a pilot from fine venues to 42 around all Chile. That, that place will be, uh, each a venue will be accessible so, so people all over Chile can get inside and get their services. Also, we have been working with Lola Palusa. That is a musical event. It's a huge musical event where you don't have internet connection, and La Salillo works perfectly. So what are, are our next steps? First is to expand our user base globally, uh, and expand our services globally. We have currently only sell in Chile, but we, because our platform is, um, we can actually uh, habilitate places remotely. Uh, we're, we're seeing for looking for partners here so that we can make the installations through them and make the mapping through our platform. We're also working on a new interface for the app. Uh, we have seen that people uh, in events and other um, installations like the museum are using it, not only blind people, but everyone, like people uh, that have hearing impairment or mobility disabilities, so that we're adding like routing through accessible routes and also uh, a new interface so that could be more interactive for people that can see. So um, he's a user, here is a user testimony that uh, he's, uh, in the presentation I show Rodrigo, he's 32 years old. Uh, he turned blind at 30, when he turned 30, through an extreme virus. And this is what we're looking for. Uh, before Lazarillo, he needed to go to the hospital with his um, uh, sister. He, sometimes when he went alone, it took, took him like two hours. With Lazarillo, he can go by himself and only took him half of the time. So right now here in the Zero Project, we're looking for partners and other solutions for people that are blind in order to maybe create an, a global solution where we can connect all what we're doing. Also, we're looking for partners that may, could make installations in different places through our platform. What we have in Innovative here is that our platform is a way to upload information. You know that for you, you don't have to create all the, like from the beginning to the end. So thank you, and if you want to contact me, please email me at rene.lazarillo.com. .tl, sorry. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you very much. Moving to our next presentation, Wayfinder, the world's first international standard for accessible audio navigation. We have two presenters who uh, I'm not sure which order they'll go in. Dr. Masahito Kawamori, I apologize if I mispronounced that, and Tiernan Kenny. So I'll turn it to the two of you. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm Tiernan from Wayfinder. Can everybody hear okay? Yeah, brilliant. And um, I'm here at Masahita, and today we're going to talk to you a bit about um, kind of the origins of Wayfinder, our work with the International Telecommunications Union, and um, how we're trying to make this new wave of consumer technologies as accessible as possible to people who are vision impaired um, from the outset. <coughs> so, ah, yes, the slides. So Wayfinder is established in early 2015. It's a partnership between two organizations. The first one is the Royal Society for Blind Children, which is a charity that works <coughs> with vision impaired children and young people in London, and a digital design studio called Us2. They make an awful lot of mobile applications and games for your mobile phone. Um, what we're trying to do as Wayfinder is make it possible for people who are blind or vision impaired to travel independently and spontaneously wherever and whenever they want to. And like a couple of the other panelists, um, we've realized that audio navigation, especially indoor audio navigation, is really one of the potential keys to unlocking this um, at a very, very grand scale. Uh, we started looking at this problem 
based on, or this challenge, I suppose, based on some issues that were highlighted by beneficiaries of the Royal Society for Blind Children. And specifically, they were looking for a way they could travel on the London Underground, the metro system in London, independently using just everyday technology. So basically the smartphones they had in their pockets. Um, we know in the UK that half of people who are vision impaired don't leave their homes as often as they would like to. And 79% of them face serious difficulties when they're trying to use public transport. And that leads to some follow-on challenges in terms of kind of unemployment, poverty, and social isolation, which you can overcome if you make it possible for people to get out and about more easily than they do at the minute. So um, we formed Wayfinder in early 2015. What we developed first was a prototype mobile application um, using Bluetooth low energy technology, the, the beacons I'm sure some of you are familiar with. We approached Transport for London and we tested that in Pimlico, one of the metro stations there. Uh, this is quite successful because it established a proof of concept for an audio navigation system for people who are vision impaired and the user feedback was really, really amazing. But at this stage, we changed our approach somewhat. somewhat. So instead of trying to develop this into a full consumer facing application and trying to get it rolled out in London and potentially beyond that, we realized there is an opportunity to have a much bigger, a much more global impact. So we decided instead of trying to create one app for ourselves and competing with all these other amazing people on the panel, what we could do was create an open standard for accessible audio navigation services so that all over the world, vision impaired people would be able to benefit from these services. And that's how we came up with the idea for the open standard. This is quite important because indoor navigation globally is probably one of the fastest growing markets out there. It was worth about four and a half billion dollars last year, I think 17 billion dollars this year, and it's estimated to grow by kind of 52% every year between now and 2022. And uh, by 2022, a quarter of the times people use a navigation application, so Google Maps or City Map or anything, it will be for a journey that's indoor. Um, and basically, consumers will come to expect this to be able to wherever and whenever they are in the world. And as it's emerging, there's a unique opportunity to make these apps, these services, accessible to a whole range of people, um, which would maybe avoid the normal curve of consumer technology emergence and adoption where accessibility follows, not necessarily as an afterthought, but where it takes an awful lot longer. So the idea of the open standard, it's effectively a set of free-to-use design guidelines and would give someone trying to deploy an audio navigation system all the information they need to make sure it's accessible to people who are vision impaired. <clears throat> and the benefit for the user is that it provides a consistent user experience no matter what application they're using, no matter what part of the world they're in, whether it's the train station or the office block they work in every day or they've just traveled to a new country. By giving this kind of consistent experience, it makes it easy for the user to know how to use audio navigation in combination with their primary mobility aids, so whether that's a guide dog or a long cane, to be able to travel independently. Um, because indoor navigation is such a rapidly emerging market, I think there isn't a single company that has more than a 12.5% market share. Um, there is a risk that you'll get all these diverging solutions emerging, and from an accessibility perspective, the likely result of that is you'll get very small groups of people who are comfortable using one or two apps in a very small number of areas. And this means that um, the potential of indoor navigation for vision impaired people won't be fully realized. So we developed this open standard over the course of about a year and a half. We had an awful lot of input from academics and experts, a lot of vision impairment charities, and an awful lot of technology developers. And as we came towards the end of this stage, <clears throat> we were thinking about the best way to get people to actually use the standard once it was finalized. And that's when we began to look at standard development organizations and international recognition. And it was at that stage we approached the International Telecommunications Union. So Masahito is going to speak to you now a bit about the ITU and its work on accessibility in general, and then more specifically, their work on indoor audio navigation. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Masahito Kamari. I'm representing International Telecommunication Union here. Okay. Um, International Telecommunication Union, or ITU, is part of the United Nations, and it's, it oversees broadcasting and telecommunication, especially in standards. It was established in 1865. It's the oldest, world's oldest international organization. It predates the United Nations. And one of, um, 
uh, we have been working with um, 193 government agencies, that is the United Nations, as well as about 800 private sector companies. And this is unique in the United Nations family because this is, ITU is the only United Nations agency that includes direct membership from private sector. Uh, we're headquartered in Geneva. And uh, we have received, we have been working on standards and we have received Emmy awards twice for our standards, uh, for our video codec. And when you see YouTube or other net streaming, most likely the video codec that you're using is our standard H.264. And these are uh, some of the standards that we, we have produced. The most important one is probably on top, is, which is the international telephone number. Uh, so when you call the United States number one, plus one is the, the code for the United States, which is standardized by International Telecommunication Union. And also I mentioned uh, H.264 and 265. These are uh, very common uh, video codec compression standards. And now um, for accessibilities, we've been working with uh, persons with disabilities, including Wayfinder, and also uh, World Federation of the Deaf for the Deaf community, as well as WHO World uh, Health Organization to address accessibility issues. As part of the United Nations family, we are dedicated to improving the, the conditions of uh, persons with disabilities by providing standards for ICT, internet, uh, information communication technology. And uh, this is the standard that we worked with Wayfinder. This is uh, F.921. And this is the, the, the world's first international standard for indoor navigation for a visually impaired person. And we're working with uh, Wayfinder still to provide more, produce more documents to um, uh, introduce more concepts, uh, test beds, certification, and things like that. Okay. So when you think about the impact of that, it means that as these indoor navigation systems are rolled out all over the world in the next year or two, you might have already seen them if you use Google Maps increasingly in airports, there's indoor mapping elements in some larger shopping, cent larger shopping centers as well. It's now possible to make these systems accessible to people who are vision impaired from the beginning. And um, we think there is a huge amount of potential in that in terms of the, the mobility implications for people who are vision impaired. So um, as Masheed mentioned, as Wayfinder, we've run pilots of audio navigation systems all over the world, in the UK, in Australia, more recently in Spain <clears throat> and in Italy. And we have plenty more coming up because the interest in this technology is really taking off. And you find especially um, people are looking at indoor navigation systems, when they find it's possible to make them accessible from the beginning, they get very enthusiastic because it means they're designing services that are usable by more and more people, and also um, it's much cheaper to make things accessible from the beginning instead of trying to retrofit accessibility into different systems or, or different buildings, as I'm sure many of you know. So um, just maybe speak a bit about kind of some of the challenges we face as Wayfinder and how we're trying to overcome them. Um, we are a slightly strange organization in that we um, are promoting the adoption of this standard, but we don't develop applications ourselves. And we're trying to deliver for end users, so people who are blind or vision impaired at scale, but not by working directly with them. I am who the people we're really trying to speak to are the application developers, the people who are out there kind of changing the world one small step at a time. And the way we try to do that is through the Wayfinder community. So this is a group of organizations who are interested in the promotion and adoption of audio navigation systems. And by bringing all of them together, we can combine all our knowledge, all our learnings, and use it to do things like improve the standards we have with the ITU and things like that. So in terms of our next steps, as Masahita said, we're continuing our work in the International Telecommunications Union. There's um, a couple of more refinements and additions to the standard in the pipeline there. The other thing we're doing as Wayfinder is we're starting to develop a training course for accessibility professionals on audio navigation and the standard more specifically. So um, this is just to build awareness, I suppose, beyond the technology community and beyond 
the, the narrow community, people look at accessibility all the time so that as these buildings are renovated or new buildings are built, people start looking at this as an accessibility solution. Um, that's more and more possible now. I've recently been included in the British standard for accessibility to the built environment, so it explicitly recognises that including an audio wayfinding system is one way to make your building more accessible. So we'll be trying to do a lot more of that in the coming years, and your support will be greatly appreciated. Thank you. Press again the button. Thank you very much. Our fourth presentation, it begins with giving independence, which uh, I think all of our presentations have spoken to. Specifically, this presentation is on OrCam MyEye, an intuitive wearable assistive device. And to make this presentation is Jennifer Keatsky. All right. Well, uh, so you have here I was rushing so that we would uh, not run over, but uh, this is, I'm sorry not to hear this presentation, but we've heard three very interesting presentations. We have time for questions or discussion. And uh, if there are anyone who has a question, either for the LV, LVE system, the um, La Lazarillo, I yeah, mispronounced city. it the first time, <laughs> or Wayfinder, please, uh, please go ahead. Question. Yes, there is, uh, okay, uh, may I help you? Yes, so please. There is, uh, two people ha raising hands. All right, if you'll okay. pick one of them. Okay, the first, you. <laughs> I hope, okay. Uh, good afternoon. Daniele Marano from the Austrian Association for the Blind and Visually Impaired. A question for the Wayfinder standards. Uh, you speak about iBeacon technology. It does mean, implies that this kind of technology, you uh, envisage, it, envisage, envisage this technology for the coming year uh, as being the base of mobility and orientation in indoor areas? Or, um, because if you are now a development standard, it means that you uh, are sure that this is the technology which will uh, bring us in the coming year uh, as, a, as a technology for the orientation. Or it could be, to your opinion, that uh, new kind of solution and uh, implying new standards should be developed, should be other technologies uh, uh, be available for the orientation and mobility of blind and vision impaired people. Thank you. Okay. So the ITU standard actually does not mention specific technologies, it mainly focuses on the user experience element, and you're right that at the moment an awful lot of indoor navigation systems are based on iBeacon technology or Bluetooth low energy technology. Um, it's also possible to use either a very strong Wi-Fi network, a 5G network, or even um, magnetic field variations as the basis for an indoor navigation system. Um, so at this stage you wouldn't necessarily want to commit to saying that one technology will categorically be used as the basis for these systems now and in the future, and um, the standard is sufficiently flexible to allow that. I think, in all honesty, I'm, I'm not much of a technologist, but you'll probably find as more and more of these applications develop, they'll be using combinations of different location technologies. So I know Rene was talking about how in some cases you can use GPS, and um, that's obviously not great in an indoor environment, but by combining GPS, Bluetooth, Wi-Fi and or 5G, that's probably where the best commercial solution is going to emerge from. Oh. So there was a question there. Sorry. Yes, uh, Mikael Snaprud, uh, Think to Norway. A question about uh, the Wayfinder organization. Um, are you organized as a membership organization? <coughs> Um, no, so Wayfinder is actually incorporated as a company which is a subsidiary of the Royal Society for Blind Children. The Wayfinder community, which is that membership arm, is absolutely free to join um, because obviously we're trying to spread what we're doing as widely as possible. So if anybody here is interested in being a part of that, um, please send me an email or kind of come up and say hi. Okay, any other questions? So, sorry. <laughs> no, that's fine. Any, anyone else? 
No hands? No hands? <laughs> yes, shy. So let me, uh, let me just make this observation. One of the things about technology, well, first of all, I'm very old. I am at that phase in life that when people invite me to speak, they always say they want the historical perspective. <laughs> so I've been around a long time. And with all new technologies, there are limitations. And yet, unless we experiment with those technologies and test them and find what they do and what they uh, have difficulty doing and refine them, we will not make progress. And I have seen tremendous strides in the use of technology to assist with navigation and orientation. And the presentations that you've heard this afternoon, I hope have given you specific information, but for me, they have also renewed my optimism that technology will, in, in many important ways, help support the full integration of blind people into society. So I, I thank all of our presenters for their, their words and the information they provided. And since we're a little ahead of schedule, perhaps you'll have a chance to approach one of our presenters individually. So thank you all for your attention. Thank you. Thank you.